Two with my guest and good friend Joel Stephen Fleming. Thanks for uh, staying exactly where you are. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't hard. Now um, I want to get back into uh, some questions, and um, this is tying back into some questions about marketing and social media and everything. Mm -hmm. um, what have you learned from your experiences with pitching, um, and do you have any advice for others like? first time pitching or any, any differences between a pilot episode or a, a web series or anything because you're delving into different um, avenues I wonder if there's any difference in your approach to mm, pitching okay so we have pitched at 13th Street we've pitched to um, you know basically all the networks you can imagine um, in Australia so including Stan and Netflix one time uh for summer school, which was a project in 2018, if you don't know it, we had like a big panel and we had to pitch to like all of them at once. So you're sitting there like nervous trying to remember like your little speech without, you know, looking at any pieces of paper. So you seem legit hmm. and you've got like six high powered content people that are like all just judging every fiber of your being. So that was fun. It can be intimidating, of course, pitching. Um, First of all, just like anything, you really need to know what your thing is. You know, what is your film project, project product, whatever the thing is. If you're on Shark Tank, it'd be the same thing, right? Mm. you got to know what it is and why anyone else would want it. So that's in film is knowing your audience. So you need, really need to research who you're in front of uh, with pitching. You know, if you're talking to, say, SBS, who we pitched to last year as well, they are... Uh, I pitched this summer school, I pitched this show, it's for like kind of young people up to about 40 year olds, it's a key demo, mm. and so they're like, great, blah, 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 we like this, we like that, we'll watch the pilot link, but just so you know, our core audience is 60 years and older, <laughs> and then we're like, oh yeah, of course, like who watches normal TV anymore? Yeah. So unless you're uh, specifically pitching to like four online like channels, like you know how they have ABC iView or things like that. Mm then you need to be really careful to even think, is this show, um, you know, anything that a network would be interested in? Because if it doesn't appeal to the older demographic, at least like 40s and over, then they they won't be interested basically because that's who watches their channels and who buys things from the advertisers. So knowing your target market, but also knowing their target market to, yeah. to make sure they match. Because you might not even... You might literally be a waste of time. Yeah. Unless they're looking for online stuff or their new online program. You know how kind of every channel's getting into on-demand stuff? Yeah. Unless that's what the meeting's about, then you might not might not even be worth pitching to ABC or SBS. If they're looking for television content, then you need to make it for the audience that's watching. So that's pretty simple. Knowing what your thing is and then who to sell it to. So if, if that doesn't suit, then you want to be approaching different avenues. Uh, the hardest thing is... For like Netflix and Sand and stuff, you can't really get in the door with them, mm. even though you know everyone young. That's all we watch pretty much, and where yeah. we would want to put our content. There's not really a way in with them unless they come to you. Yeah. Uh, that occasion when I got in front of them was part of a film festival where we got to pitch to all of them. It was like a special event. So um, other than that, and kind of competitions run through the directors and writers guilds, uh, through actor things like that. That's another way to pitch to those kind of executives that actor is in AACTA yeah actor, that's yeah. one of them so yeah. things like that anything that's run by a big organisation or a fund uh, you know like a funding body or a directors or writers guild kind of thing that's mm. a way to get in front of those otherwise you can't really get, you know you can't approach them you can't email anyone so yeah, your doors that are open all the time are ABC and SBS so as far as just getting your content to someone that matters, that's the only ones you can get to it when you're really at the ground level and no one knows your name yet. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and then just think about if they'd even want your content, basically. Would you... Um, uh, so, maybe with the demographic thing, maybe with the... Um, so, so, for example, do you, have, do you have pictures that you sort of keep on, on file 
let's mm-hmm. say like you get because you might not have the opportunity now to talk to Netflix or whatever yep. um, but you find out that you're going to be able to and you've got that one or two uh, pitches you've got the one or two pitches that you want for them do you yeah. just sort of keep them ready or are you always focusing more so on your latest uh, no and then, like with writers they recommend you have like multiple projects and the more you can get like kind of written to a level where they're kind of ready to go yeah it's better so at the moment we've got our new show Riggleton which you obviously are in um, we've got the old stuff for summer school if if it came up if someone's looking for that kind of thing we've yeah. got all our pitch documents and stuff written yeah I've got um, my first feature that I finished writing that's in early draft stages, but I, I could pitch that, you know, right now if I had to. Yeah. So if you're a creator and a writer, you need to know all your different products and how to sell them and the differences between them and who they're for. That, I would recommend that. And the way you do that, um, like the industry standard is having like a one page hmm. document. So that'll be like your pitch doc. You can sometimes um, send that one page you're out unsolicited and they might actually read it because it's one page, you know, yeah. they glance over it. If, if something catches their eye, they might read it properly. Then they might ask for the script. So that's something there's to a talent of writing that too. And it's like the specific, you know, concise bits of information like that mm. log line that's got to hook them in and that short synopsis to see, Oh, is this going to go anywhere? And you, so there's all these steps to try and keep them reading. So if you want, uh, you could always post uh, a link to one of our examples of that. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll add everything. Uh, I'll add some stuff in the show notes, um, some examples and some links um, to some of Joel's material as a bit of a, a template or an example. Yeah, so and we for did. Anyone, uh, anyone who's uh, looking for a pitch, <laughs> <laughs> we did that course. I don't know if you remember. We ran a course, basic like teaching storytelling for actors. Mm. So we did a lot, covered a lot of that in there. So if you want, I can just give you a link to some of the documents we made. Yeah, sounds uh, good. I'll put that in the in the show notes. Cool. Um, so how did 13th street films come around did, did that uh did that arise out of you found your your core crew and you all got along and you wanted to kind of give yourselves a name and kind of codify or was that it? how how was that uh yeah so it started uh with basically me returning because i used to live in europe did a couple of commercials and stuff there went back here and thought how can i get network and get into the community i know i'll just go to uni and i'll upskill and do it at the same time Mm. so that's why i did that at like 29 so i was like one of the oldest people there joel looks very young (laughs) he told me how old he was once and i didn't believe him they never do and i'm hoping that will just continue for my whole life that i'll never look as old as i am yeah so you're not the only only baby face (laughs) so you know chris slater Mm -hmm. he's like the only one who was like anywhere like older than me and he was like 50 so i was like yes at least i'm not the oldest guy and then we all call him dad even me i can get away with it so chris is lovely (laughs) yeah he's a great boy but um sorry what was the question again the the question was the the origin of oh okay so basically i was like okay we so i need like a brand name like a production company to start with and we made this first year film uh which you can see on youtube called jehovah it's a horror comedy and it just really hit at festivals we chucked it into festivals like why not you know and i was putting my own money behind it because i'm like yeah it's pretty like turned out pretty good and it really hit and picked up and it ended up playing about 15 16 festivals over like a year or so period so like oh we need like a production company name if we're going to get get things played at a festival we kind of wanted to start like the basics of branding and stuff so 13 is my favorite number I'm a tragic sports guy, unlike most filmmakers, love sports, played basketball my whole life, that's my jersey number, you choose your number in basketball, ah, so I chose okay. it, you know, the unlucky 13, Yeah. so I chose it, because uh, no one else would ever want it, mm. kind of weird thing that I was like, oh, I don't believe in superstitious stuff, I was an atheist from a very young age at a Catholic school, <laughs> so I was number 13, so that's where the name, it doesn't really have any uh, deeper meaning, I just like, oh yeah, that's cool, mm. um, yeah, and uh, so that's where the name came from simple like kind of smart memorable name was the idea just like you know how you when you think of a band name yeah so like it i it appealed to me and i thought it's simple and memorable you know people can process what it is a lot of weird uh, like production companies have odd names that you can't spell yeah and like how do people google you like it's a bad move so that was one of the things i thought about and i did it and then it kind of expanded that i kept working with the same great group of people the same kind of sound guy the same production designer which is sean and we kind of all became this group uh, organically, I kept wanting those people because they perform well in the, in the crew, hmm. and it just grew and grew and kept making 
a lot of content outside what we had to do for uni. So we we're making a lot more than most other students and learning faster, making mistakes, making different stuff. So that one of the things I set myself as a goal at uni was to make different films, not necessarily the exact thing I wanted to make, like mm. push myself. So we made like a one shot film. We made a 360, you know, like a VR film when it was very early days technology. And it was like a $400 camera. It's like bloody terrible quality. It looks like 360p kind of, you know what I mean? That's <laughs> because it's stretching that HD yeah. over like all the areas potato, of the frame. So we quality. kind of co-directed that a couple of mates and me, and it was really fun. And we did this roulette scene where they're all, all the characters at a round table. So it worked really well for the shape ah. of the thing where you could watch each character at any time. So things like that, we tried, I tried kind of every genre, you know, I did a horror, did a drama, did a thriller, did a, you know, um, girl, and like, I kind of went away from comedy the whole of uni to try all those things, but mm. I've always loved comedy and now I'm back into like yeah. almost doing entirely comedy unless employed to do something else. Yeah. Cause it's just where I kind of, I'm awkward and I am loud and obnoxious and that's where I belong. <laughs> Especially if you're writing material. And you're kind of playing to your strengths and you're improving on what you've done before and everything. It's 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 actually funny you say that about your 13th Street. Um, when I applied for Short and Sweet the last year or the year before, um, basically I had a one-man show and I did everything yeah. in it. And I was the writer, the, yeah, the to make it, composer everything. and all that. So I had to come up with a theatre group name yeah. or something like that. And I did the exact same thing of like, I called it Orphan Collective. Because I thought it was clever because um, there was only one person in it, which is me. <laughs> That's yeah. actually cool, though, too. It's got a good ring to it. You know, those certain names that, like, stand out. That sounds like a band. And, it, and that's funny because that, <laughs> it stemmed out of, like, yeah. my... Because I've been a musician for a okay, long yeah. time. You do those... You, you like, mm, the, the somethings. That would be a cool band name. <laughs> that, you do, the, you do yeah. that forever. <laughs> um, so I wanted to get a bit, uh, a bit broader... Um, in terms of some ch- some things in your um, your personal and professional life, and I, yep. I was curious about what change uh, in your life in the last year or so. It doesn't have to be that strict. Um, has most positively impacted your life? Okay, so that's easy. So it's definitely um, well, it's personal and professional. So Sean that I keep talking about is my girlfriend, and um, we probably got together. A- about a year and a half ago or something like that mm. and it just um, we'd always work together in film and being uh, friends she's a production designer and also a writer as well and we just always got along really well and then like kind of things all fell into place where we started it became romantic mm. and I think just as far as like in positive influence on my life uh, someone like her is just um, you know amazingly creative so therefore just inspires me as well and just as such a kind funny you know lovely person as well Hmm. so she's really just uh a slam dunk because according to me um because yeah you know we can do we can do film we can talk about film all day and uh she it doesn't drive her insane which is a rare because you know people with relationships outside that art bubble it can really be a strain Hmm. so that's one thing and yeah i just think um us working together and our personal life it's just been awesome and made me more positive and made me kind of more hungry and to pursue my goals and everything so that's got to be it got to give her props bouncing off her don't show her this though yeah. <laughs> it's all right. no one will watch this no one cares <laughs> um now who or what do you think of when i say success hmm so what do I think of? That's an interesting. Could notion. be a person, could be a project, could be uh, um, time. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's like a myriad of things for me because I am like into sports and stuff. So if I think of someone, something that's like pure like greatness, think of someone like Michael Jordan. Hmm. It's just like an absolute phenomenon. Like clearly, head and shoulders above any PR in his field. Yeah. And physically. <laughs> uh, no, no, there's taller ones really? <laughs> and shoulders about most of people in well, the is world it, yeah. Is it and shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but like the people like that um filmmaking wise someone like stanley kubrick who mm. was such a unique thinker 
and just such an auto and driven and just like, no, trust me, this is like going to be awesome. And everyone's like, oh God, he's crazy. You know, there's stories of him doing 20 takes of someone like opening a door or putting a prop down or whatever that he had because he's, it wasn't right yet, you know, and like that kind of, kind of egomaniacal, but like also brilliant. Mm. I guess that's what I kind of aspire to be without offending anyone (laughs) is like being that kind of obsessed with perfection. The idea of perfection is like obviously kind of ridiculous Mm. and redundant, but also it's like something to chase. Right. And what's a human without some goal and struggle? Like, what do you do? I always think it's like sad. You know, you think of success, like people think, Oh, if I won the lotto, I'd be happy. Mm. And I think that's the worst possible thing for you. If that's the way you think. Yeah. Um, so success, um, for me would be more artistically driven because it's not defined by, you know, you can't just say, Oh, Michael Jordan, he won. He's the best. It's, it's not the same system with art, you know, uh, for me, I'm thinking about it as my own fulfillment and then like how I can positively affect others, like in my kind of inner circle and friends, Mm. family, whatever. Yeah. Which sounds cliche, but I think it, whatever, makes you feel rewarded to me it's always also the relentless pursuit of improvement Mm. and like i always want to make the next idea i get excited about the next idea while i'm finishing this idea Mm. and but i also at the same time want this idea to be amazing and um you know you never really can make the film exactly how it was in your head and that's kind of the the chase the dragon thing for a writer director is like oh the next one i'm gonna make it closer to what i imagine Mm. and you want to just pull that margin in and eventually hopefully get to that level where you have industry money and you can kind of almost do exactly what you set out to do which would be cool yeah yeah does that answer it i don't know yeah no <laughs> yeah i totally get what you mean um so we've mentioned this um a few times uh throughout tonight um but i wanted to talk about it a bit more um directly so at the moment um you're in the midst of a fundraiser for Riggleton, can you can you explain a bit yeah. about what Riggleton is? And- so Riggleton is a comedy mockumentary series. Uh, it's about a small town that could be anywhere in Australia, and the the kind of theme and the <laughs> core of the show is about globalization and like a loss of identity. So it, that doesn't that sounds serious, but it's really fun and silly. Yeah, but that's kind of the theme. That's the core. So this town's kind of bankrupt, in trouble, and they are. Uh, They've got this just useless mayor who's our main character. So he's Clint Riggleton. He's basically royalty. He was, you know, born to be mayor. His dad was mayor. His granddad was mayor. And his great-grandfather before him who started the town. And he's just got this job that he is ill-equipped to kind of do. And it's kind of that, you know, show like The Office or Parks and Rec where it's this person just kind of out of their depth. And that's where the comedy lies. And then from there we extrapolate into the townspeople, uh, which, you know, there's... 13 main characters which sounds crazy so big ensemble cast all these different weird characters all the kind of local legends you meet in a country town maybe someone's like exactly the kind of person you know it might be you might be like your brother or your uncle or something like that or you might find them completely ridiculous and bizarre but Mm. either way it's really fun uh you know we've got um a town cop who thinks he's like you know the biggest detective in new york and he runs around with his sheriff's hat on and with his hand on his gun even though he's solving trivial matters like missing shoes and you know we've got a teenage DJ here which is uh, played by Matt who you know thinks he's um, DJ Max <laughs> DJ Max Atrillion. thinks he's Armin Van Buren or one of those whoever the cool DJ is to reference yeah. these days I wouldn't know some <laughs> some German house techno guy. yeah some Dutch guy or whatever but uh yeah so there's just a, just this like um, a madhouse of this small town and then the thing that it's actually about is will this town lose its identity and what makes all those people unique and sell out or will they find a way to come together and keep the town alive and you know that uniqueness that you find in a country town that you don't find in like big cities hmm. doesn't all look the same you know everywhere we go here there's like the same coffee shops the same clothing stores and everything's really just whitewashed and boring so that's what I loved about the idea was that's keeping that identity of what makes a town yeah does that make sense? Yeah. So we're fundraising. We've got less than two weeks to go. If you want to come to the premiere, if you're in Brisbane, it's at New Farm Cinemas, August 8th. So if you buy a ticket to that for 20 bucks, see a lot of our content, meet us, the cast, 
a lot of other filmmakers, it's a good networking event as well. I'll be there if that's of any benefit. So yeah, it's only 20 bucks. Come and check it out. And uh, that goes towards helping us make the rest of the show. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. I'll uh, add links uh, in the show notes below. So, Joel, where can people find you? Where can they find 13th Street uh, online? Where can they say hello? All right. Awesome. So, on Facebook, it's just 13th Street Films. So, at 13th Street Films, if you're tagging it. Um, same with Welcome to Riggleton. It's at Welcome to Riggleton. You can also f- probably find that through 13th Street Films, which is easier to type in. Um, on Instagram, um, at Joel Steven with a PH. That's my, yeah, old school Instagram. And then we also have one for Welcome to Riggleton as well, if you want to check out that content. We have um, a bunch of great little sketches and little short clips to give you a taste of what the show's like, if you're interested. As well as like a big teaser scene that we made as well that's part of the pilot. So you can check that out. So I'll have, um, I'll have links to uh, the Facebook pages, the Instagram um, pages, uh, Joel's website, 13thstreetfilms.com. Mm-hmm. Um, his podcast uh, uh, inside the actor's studio apartment that's on the um, 13th Street Film uh, website as well as well as uh, what, what what platforms you have that on you have that on uh, Apple Play whatever the you can get it on iTunes, iTunes you can subscribe and you can just listen to it through SoundCloud and we post a link on our page if you want to follow us every two weeks there's a new episode so this week we just uh, released one talking about all things horror movies which usually is a fan favorite, so it should be a good one. Hmm. And um, uh, since we've got a bit of extra time, um, so 13th Street Films, um, you also do uh, a couple of other, like, so you do um, some some sketches every now and then, and mm-hmm. you do showreel scenes and things like that. Are there any other, so if people want to get involved with you um, in, in that regard, what, is there anything you offer in that regard or yeah so we can do showreel scenes so if it's emerging actors who need more content um, you know we get a lot of theater actors who like I want to get into film but I don't really have anything on you know tape on video so we do scenes from only 800 so usually people do two hander scenes they put in 400 each which is nothing um, and you get our crew which are amazing yeah award-winning filmmakers to shoot your scene for half a day and um, yeah that we usually have it all done and handed in to you in a couple of weeks after the shoot so it's a really great um simple service you can do that do you, as, still, do, you do, um, do you do reels as well still uh as in like editing yeah you can yeah, yeah we can edit show reels uh, we can do self tapes for you if you want direction or if you just want someone to shoot it joel cut my one of my first <laughs> yeah your show reels. Yeah. yeah yeah always yeah. available for any of that stuff um yeah if you're an actor also we'll probably be running our course again which is our uh, film 101 this is basically teaching you the skills to make your own content a lot of actors these days with social media and everything they want to get into making their own content so we can teach you all the basic ways to do that and all the different levels from you know shooting it on your iphone to hiring a little group like us if you want to shoot something at like a professional level quality so that so, information is usually on facebook yeah, yeah, that's yep. all through our Facebook. It's also a whole course outline on our website. Cool. And, um, you know, an, an actor who came through Film 101 last year in November was shooting his horror film this week. Cool. So it's got to that stage. He's did seven drafts, perfected the script. He's excited to shoot it. So he's, um, you know, putting up the budget for it and he's starring in it mm. and we're shooting it over the next two nights. So it's going to be really exciting and cool to see something come through the program and become, you know, come to life as a film. Yeah, nice. Cool. Well, thanks, super. Uh, thanks, heaps, for uh, joining me tonight. Thanks for no coming around. Man. And uh, all the links and pages and information um, will be in the show notes below, above whatever platform this is on. Uh, thanks very much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. See you later.